They came for me January 15, 1982. I was about to take a bath, the doorbell rang. Nine, ten o'clock at night, my mom called my name and I opened the bathroom door and there were two guys with guns pointed at me. I was staring into the barrel of two guns. People have asked me, were you scared? No, because I'm brave, I'm not brave at all. Actually, it's a confession, I'm afraid of, of um, cockroaches. I don't know, I haven't really met any. Actually, last night when I went to the bathroom, I was thinking, oh my gosh, it's hot here. Do they have cockroaches here? So I was totally petrified, but I'm not, because I live in Canada, we do have cockroaches there, but they are puny, like they're nothing. And you don't need to be afraid of them. But I'm talking about the Middle Eastern cockroaches. They are huge. They are like two inches, three inches long, and they fly and they get into everything. I mean, it's nasty. I know, it's scary. So if I see one of those here, I'm going to scream, I'm going to run through the doors and never ever come back. That is fear. Yes, that is fear. But you have grown up reading Jane Austen and Ernest Hemingway and now, and falling in love with Donny Osmond, and now you're staring at two guns. What are you going to do, scream and run? I don't think so. You are going to enter a state of shock. A state of shock is like, you know, if you have played video games, it's like body armor. You put it on, you don't become invincible to bullets, but you become invincible to emotion. It is a survival mechanism, a gift from God. You put it on and you don't feel anything. I was looking at my mom and dad and they were crying and I was saying, why are you crying? No big deal, I'm getting arrested. It didn't sink in. And the guards put me in a car and I was all chatty and smiley all the way to the prison. You think I was going to the movies or something? I didn't get it. And they blindfolded me upon arrival and they took me in and it was very quiet and dark. Well, because I was blindfolded, but then I sat in a hallway and they called my name and they took me for interrogation. I was 16 and I had never been trained how to deal with interrogation. And I couldn't see the guy who was questioning me. He said his name was Ali. So he started questioning me. Have you attended protest rallies against the government? I said, yes. What is the point of lying? I went to protest rallies every day after school. I don't know what you people do after school, but that's what we did. We went protesting. He asked, have you written articles against the government? Yes, I had written articles against the government in my school newspaper. Everybody knew it. The principal knew it, and the principal worked for the Revolutionary Guard. So, yeah. And then he asked me, where is Shahzad? Shahzad is a girl's name. I had no idea where this girl was. I had met with her once. She was a university student, a Marxist. She wanted me to join her group and write for them. I said, no. I had figured that Marxism and Catholicism, they don't really go well together, but the arrest had really started too. So you know what, that was kind of a consideration as well. So I said no. And she went her way, and, and I went my way, and she, was, she wasn't arrested, she escaped, and I was arrested, I was caught. So now, these interrogator people, they wanted to know where this girl was. Apparently she was important, I don't know. Probably even Sharon thought it wasn't her real name. And I said, I don't know, I swear to God, I don't know. And they took me to another room. They took off my blindfold. I was in a small room with two men, Ali and Hamid. They asked me again, where is Shahzad? I was looking around the room. There were a desk, there was a desk, two chairs, and a bare wooden bed in a corner. And I couldn't take my eyes off it. And they decided to handcuff me, and when they handcuffed me, they saw that my hands, I was 95 pounds back then, they saw that my hands are going to slide out of the cuff. So they put both of my wrists together, and they put the two wrists into one cuff, and as it clicked, I literally heard my right wrist crack. And I screamed my head off, and if I knew where this Shahzad was, at that point, I would have told it with whipped cream on top. I would, if the devil appeared and said, hey, Marina, uh, sell me your soul, I'm going to get you back home to your mom. I would have sold my soul. But that was not an option. So they tied me to the bare wooden bed. They lashed the soles of my feet with a length of cable. Shoes off, socks off. It's the most favorite form of torture in the Middle East because your nerve ends are in your feet. So with every strike, your nervous system 
explodes and then is magically put back together, you're wide awake for the next. And you think you're going to pass out, you think you're going to die, you're not. Those who use torture, they will tell you that it is to get information, they lie. Torture is designed to break the human soul. When they succeed, they stop. If they don't succeed, then they will execute you. Torture is hard work. There are easier ways to kill people. If they want to kill you, they will shoot you or hang you or stone you. There is no need for torture. Torture is really hard work. So there is another reason, a devious reason behind it. People were getting death sentences left and right. I got one. My courtroom, it happened when I wasn't there, but someone told me later, it probably took 30 seconds, and they gave me that sentence. A courtroom in Evin prison, which is 100% operational right now, as we speak, is a Sharia judge sitting behind the desk, passing verdicts every 30 seconds. There is no lawyer, there is no jury, there is no justice. I got a death sentence, it was reduced to life in prison, and I was sent to the cell block. In the cell block, everything was hard. They had put 50, 60, 70 prisoners in a cell that was built for five. When you have so many people in a small space, you have problems. The first night I woke up at, you know, late. I don't know what time it was. But I wanted to go to the bathroom. And I looked around me, and people were sleep sleeping on the floors like sardines. If I wanted to go, I had to walk on people because there was no room between them to put my foot down. And I wasn't going to walk on my friends. Most of them were bloody and swollen. So I waited for dawn. And then at dawn, when the call for prayer comes and everybody has to get up, there are 300 people in line ahead of you. So you have to stand in line for a long time. And as we are standing in line, 90% of us under the age of 20. There are names being called over the loudspeaker every once in a while. So and so and so and so come to the office. These people are being taken for torture, interrogation, or maybe even execution. If your name is called, you will go. Because if you don't, they will come and shoot you there. So you still have a better chance if you go nicely. And then the rest of us who are left, what are we doing? We do what young girls do best. We talked. What did we talk about? About social justice? No, that didn't end well. No. We talked about everything that makes you human. Have you ever thought what makes you human? For the first time, I thought of it in a bathroom line in Evin prison. That's where I discovered my humanity odd place. What I discovered is your happy memories. It's the memory that someone loves you. You would talk about birthday parties, family reunions, going to the movies, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, baking, cooking, shopping, watching the little house on the prairie together, having popcorn, that sort of thing. The memory of love in a place that's very dark and void of it, or so it seems. But you have your friends, and you share those memories. I carry the memories of every single girl who ever stood in a bathroom line with me. I don't remember all their names or all their faces. Many of them are dead, buried, in mass graves. Shahnoush, my friend I told you about, she was executed before I was even arrested at the age of 15. And we don't know where they put her body. She never got a funeral. So that is why I'm here. I'm here because it happened. I'm here because it's still happening. I'm here because I lived when other people died and it wasn't my call. It was just what happened. Back then, there was another form of torture in Evin prison. Young girls were called at midnight and returned to the cell block at 5 a.m. with no torture signs. 
If you knew one of them, you would go and ask them and say, hey, where were you last night? And she would say, oh, you know, they took me for interrogation, but I sat there all night, nothing happened, which was lame. And you could tell it was a lie. And then you would respect her because she didn't want to talk about it. And you would walk away. I was called for interrogation six months after my arrest. It was daytime. My interrogator, Ali, looked into my eyes and said, listen, you had the death sentence. Now it is reduced to life in prison. You're going to be here forever and nobody cares. So now you're going to become my wife. And if you don't, I will arrest your parents and your boyfriend. Is that clear? Oh, it was clear. I had survived that far because I believed I will go home one day. That one day the nightmare will end and I will go home. But if he arrested my parents, there wouldn't be a home to go back to. So I said, okay, I'll marry you. Didn't mean that I would be released. Actually, I asked him to send me to solitary. Now, anybody who's been in solitary knows it's insane. Every day is 3,000 years. But I begged him to send me to solitary. Why? Because what was, was I going to do? Was I going to sit, go sit my, with my girlfriends over a bowl of soup and say, hey, guys, do you know what I did last night? I slept with my interrogator. No, doesn't sound good. I didn't. I didn't want to talk about it. So I stayed in solitary, and I was being raped over and over and over with no end in sight. And it was legal because some Sharia judge had married me off to my interrogator at the age of 17.